Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Chronic Kidney Disease, How a Deeper Understanding of the Disease is Impacting Clinical Development. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now, this chat box is located in the control panel and that's found on the right hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank MedPace, who developed the content for this presentation. MedPace is a scientifically driven, global, full-service clinical contract research organization providing phase one to four clinical development services to the biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and medical device industries. MedPace's mission is to accelerate the global development of safe and effective medical therapeutics through its high science and discipline operating approach that leverages local regulatory and deep therapeutic expertise across all major areas. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to your speakers for today's event. And first, I'd like to speak to you to introduce you to Dr. Ajay Srivastava. Uh, he is the Senior Medical Director in the Medical Department with MedPace. He is a board-certified nephrologist with an extensive background in both clinical and academic medicine. Specializing in adult nephrology, he brings over 13 years of experience in both the common and rare conditions of the kidney renal replacement therapies, ICU nephrology, including IV resuscitation and management, and comorbid in conditions such as cardiorenal syndrome and hypertension. And our second speaker I'd like to introduce you to is Carrie Scheel, Senior Director of Clinical Trial Management with MedPace. She has more than 16 years of experience in clinical research, including clinical monitoring and global trial management of phase one to four studies and programs with DOD and non-diluted funding. Carrie has experience in a wide array of indications and therapeutic areas, including but not limited to nephrology, rare disease, metabolic, cardiovascular, as well as infectious disease. And now it is my pleasure to pass over the controls and the mic to our first speaker, Dr. Srivastava. So Dr. Srivastava, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you so much, Sonia, um, and thanks everybody for being here. I cannot tell you how extremely delighted I am to have this opportunity to, to speak with all of you today, especially since it truly is an exciting time for nephrology. So let's go ahead and get started because I've got so many things uh, to talk to you about today. Um, we'll start with a broad overview of chronic kidney disease and its related comorbid conditions today, including and especially cardiovascular disease. And in the context of this presentation, uh, we'll be discussing some of the important tests that are in, in, involved with the evaluation of chronic kidney disease and their use in endpoints for clinical trials. We're also going to talk about future considerations and hence opportunities uh, from the perspective and importance of emerging biomarkers. We'll delve into the nuances of study design considerations in the setting of nephrology, and we're going to conclude with the myriad of potential areas of study in relation to kidney disease. So let's start with some simple but really important concepts that I really want you to keep in mind as we progress through the presentation. We're going to start with the fact that uh, chronic kidney disease, or CKD, is one of today's uh, leading health, uh, public health problems, which is increasing in both frequency and prevalence over time. And it has become recognized as a key independent risk factor for several adverse health outcomes um, including, and very importantly, cardiovascular disease, which we'll delve into as we progress through uh, the presentation today. So with that in mind, let's start with the fundamentals in the setting of understanding kidney function, of which GFR is one of the most important concepts uh, with regard to the evaluation and study of kidney disease. And so what is GFR exactly? So GFR stands for glomerular filtration rate. 
And essentially, it's the sum of filtration rates of all the functioning nephrons in the kidney. The nephron is basically the um, functional and structural unit of the kidney. And each kidney can easily have over a million of these microscopic units that work in unison uh, to do a number of important functions, including especially filtration. So it's an assumed index of functional renal mass because we can't actually go in and test each of these individual nephrons. And in totality, we generally filter about 100 to 125 milliliters per minute, which equates to about 180 liters per day, per day which is substantial. And if you think about it, that equates to about 90 of those two liter soda bottles uh, that you can pick up in the, in the grocery store. And that's significant for two organs that are the size of your fist. It's, it's amazing. So when the GFR actually declines, uh, as a nephrologist, we try to look at it in terms of where the disease process is taking place. And we tend to break it down into three major areas. If it's intrinsic renal disease, that means the disease is progressing with a decreased number of functioning nephrons, those functional units. Uh, so there's an issue with the parenchyma of the kidneys. If it's pre-renal, we're looking at potentially a decline in renal perfusion basically before it hits the kidney. For instance, those patients that might be hypotensive or in septic shock. And if there is an obstruction, we call that an outflow issue, such as patients that might have kidney stones or cancers that are blocking uh, urine flow. Whatever the case may be, when there's a decline in GFR, that means there's a decrease in filtration and subjects or patients are susceptible to increased toxins. Overall, GFR um, fundamentally tells us how our kidneys are functioning, and the decreased GFR is detrimental to our well-being, and those that have a chronic decline in their GFR have CKD. So how do we therefore define CKD? So CKD is basically any disorder uh, that is characterized by alterations in kidney structure and function. The manifestations uh, which do depend on the underlying causes, but objectively we can actually identify with tests that include imaging, such as uh, ultrasound or CT scans for structural or anatomic causes. Uh, urinalyses can tell us if there are uh, blood or protein uh, in the urine, which would suggest damage. Serum creatinine values, which we are going to discuss heavily during the course of this presentation, which we can plug into estimation formulas. And urine protein levels, which also suggest uh, damage within the kidneys. So the damage or decreased kidney function has had to have had been around for at least three months, regardless of the underlying cause. The reason primarily being that there should be opportunity to ensure that this is not something that is uh, reversible or acute. Um, and basically when that occurs, we call that acute kidney injury uh, as opposed to chronic kidney disease. Now certainly it is possible for acute issues to cause uh, chronic kidney disease after some level of potential recovery. Also, having a definition allows for objective identification and classification of CKD without actually having to know the etiology of the underlying cause. And this concept alone has really helped increase the awareness of kidney disease exponentially. Uh, now, when the EGFR drops below 60, as we see here on the slide, or 60%, as you will, uh, there's a notable increased risk for a number of things, and that includes cardiovascular uh, disease and all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality as well, the progression of the underlying CKD, or uh, chronic kidney disease illness, uh, acute kidney injury, subjects or, or patients are more susceptible to acute kidney injury, and they're more susceptible to end stage progression to end-stage renal disease, at which point they may require dialysis um, or transplant. Now, this risk is multiplied when there is proteinuria, basically protein in the urine. So we're going to see that on the heat map in, a, in another slide that's upcoming. So the development of a staging or classification system for CKD was absolutely profound in that it actually changed the very concept that kidney disease was an uncommon life-threatening disease that was cared for only by subspecialists, including nephrologists like myself, it's one that was actually rather a more common condition with a range of severity that could actually be uh, identified and managed earlier by clinicians. So that in essence, uh, it showed that it was possible to slow the progressive course of CKD and that patients would uh, not, amongst other things, in effect, require immediate dialysis. And I can't tell you how many times when I was in practice that um, 
that I would see patients for the first time, and unfortunately, the first news I had to give them was that they had to be on dialysis very quickly. So increasing the um, awareness was key. So therefore, the aim is to identify and risk stratify patients efficiently, especially those that are most severe, and to initiate treatments early enough and have a greater effect on slowing down disease progression uh, as it relates to both renal and overall morbidity. Now, these GFR ranges, which I'm going to discuss in more detail shortly, also form a core foundation of eligibility requirements in clinical trials, whether it be early phase um, healthy normal volunteer populations or renal impairment studies, um, as well as late phase trials. In fact, um, and unfortunately, we find that many trials will not include patients with advanced CKD. In fact, up to 75% of clinical trials may exclude patients with CKD, which, as we will see many times, are really the population that really needs the therapy. So let's talk about these um, stages real quick. So basically, there are five um, overall stages, which also have substages as well. And as you can see, as the staging progresses, uh, so does the severity of the kidney dysfunction in relation to uh, GFR. Uh, the GFR, once it gets down to uh, less than 15, we label them as being in kidney failure. Now, at that point, um, they may also require um, renal replacement therapy or dialysis, uh, at which point we label them as being in ESRD. Now, interestingly enough, if the GFR is above 60% and do not have other markers of kidney disease, then we don't call them as having CKD. So generally speaking, if they are above 60% kidney function, they do require other markers of kidney disease. Uh, subsequent to the original uh, classification or staging system for CKD came the addition of albuminuria, or which is a type of protein, or total protein which we will see in the next slide here, actually infers worsening prognosis. So as we can see very nicely, that's exemplified by this heat map from KDGO guidelines, we see that the prognosis, whether it be all-cause mortality, or more specifically, cardiovascular morbidity or mortality, uh, CKD progression, AKI, ESRD development, will all have a similar pattern, uh, which is related to kidney disease progression and multiplied by proteinuria. So as you can see, as the kidney function gets worse, so does your risk for uh, prognosis severity. And this is multiplied as we see uh, the worsening of proteinuria or protein in the urine. So as such, this particular slide here shows that there are a number of debilitating comorbid conditions associated uh, with CKD. The two most common being cardiovascular disease um, and infection. And we're going to delve into cardiovascular disease as the talk uh, progresses on the next few slides. Now, complications may actually arise not only by the underlying processes themselves for CKD, but also from the adverse effects of the interventions that are utilized to manage or prevent the disease or its comorbidities. Each of these areas offer a significant need for study and intervention. As you can see here, uh, the number of complications are enormous. We're gonna also talk about how CKD mineral or bone disease, um, um, also called CKD MBD for short, uh, may contribute to cardiovascular disease in the next few slides but the kidneys are responsible for bone and calcium and phosphorus homeostasis. Anemia is also a major issue in those with CKD and especially those who are on dialysis and is a major area and focus of study. Those that have CKD also suffer from volume overload or resistant hypertension and heart failure. They're also more susceptible to systemic drug toxicity because they're on a, they're on a number of concomitant medications, far more so than uh, patients from other disease processes. And as we will talk about, adherence in clinical trials is key, and this can be uh, significantly affected by those that are on a number of different uh, medications, all with significant uh, adverse effects. Cognitive decline and impaired physical ability or frailty, especially for those on dialysis, are key areas of study. Uh, metabolic disorders or, and or electrolyte imbalances, especially high potassium values, are also areas of study. Um, malnutrition uh, is a highly underrated 
but enormously important uh, consideration in the longevity of the CKD and ESRD patient. And certainly ESRD itself, uh, which also includes uh, the need for study of different devices in this area, which we'll talk about towards the end of the talk, are certainly a very important areas of focus. Overall, the risk for all-cause mortality in this patient population is absolutely significant. So let's talk about the big issue in the room, cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is the leading uh, cause of death worldwide. It is a global killer, a global killer, even more so uh, for those with CKD, given, the, given that the prevalence uh, and mortality of um, due to cardiovascular disease is much higher in the CKD population. So again, those that have CKD um, have higher prevalence and mortality due to cardiovascular disease. In fact, um, it can be upwards of 30 times higher prevalence in those with CKD than the general population. Additionally, we do see a higher chance of three vessel um, coronary artery disease in those with CKD. And just as notable, is that a patient with CKD is more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than they would to progress to ESRD where they could be put on dialysis. Let me say that one more time. Those with CKD are far more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than they would be able to progress to ESRD and have a life-saving therapy. This is substantial and very worrisome, and we really need to change that. So the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease, in essence, are major considerations uh, in the management of those with CKD. It's also clear that the traditional risk factors, which we see here on the left uh, for cardiovascular disease, are really not enough to represent the notable increase in cardiovascular mortality uh, we see in CKD and ESRD patients. So we see our traditional risk factors over here on the left, some of which are modifiable, uh, such as uh, dyslipidemia, uh, smoking, diabetes, and hypertensive control uh, or obesity, and others that are not, like age, which so happens to be uh, one of the strongest predictors of cardiovascular risk in any risk equation that we utilize. And we have the CKD risk factors over here on the right, some of which you will recognize from the previous slide that where I showed uh, complications. Now, all of these risk factors may be compounded in the CKD patient as they are susceptible to many more of them than the general population. And overall, can lead to differing uh, causes for heart dysfunction, which ultimately lead to cardiovascular events and mortality. Um, so therefore, regardless of the underlying disease process causing the CKD, we can see some common themes with the CKD-related risk factors that also allow, in addition to the original disease, um, additional opportunities for study in the prevention management as they relate to these risk factors. As such, um, basically achieving efficacy and multiple targets can improve the overall morbidity and mortality rates uh, in this population. Uh, we talked about albuminuria a little bit. Uh, malnutrition, anemia can be a major cause for um, high output heart failure. Inflammation uh, today is a very big area of study uh, in the decreasing of cardiovascular events uh, in those with CKD. Um, but let's take a look at mineral, mineral metabolism disorders as an example, uh, which uh, tends to occur as CKD progresses, uh, especially below uh, when they get below 60%, since the kidneys are also responsible for bone health and calcium and phosphorus homeostasis, like I talked about earlier. And in this setting, there tends to be resorption of bone um, as the kidney function declines. And what ends up occurring is what we call metastatic calcification, which can actually deposit in such areas as the coronary arteries. Now, with that in mind, let me show you something real interesting. If we take a look at the characteristics of coronary plaques, okay, which is what this study did. Um, coronary plaques, which ultimately are the precursors to myocardial infarctions or heart attacks, we see significant differences in some of the properties of these plaques in those with CKD. And this particular trial by Cato and colleagues looked at those with a GFR, less than 60%, like we talked about on the previous slide, uh, and for uh, CKD, stage three or worse. Um, and in this study, actually, the mean GFR was actually about 48 
um, against those that did not have CKD. And utilizing a technique called intracoronary optical coherence tomography, uh, the authors actually evaluate, evaluated these plaque characteristics. As you can see, there were a number of significant differences. And look at this, calcification. And we just talked about that, right? Uh, mineral bone disorders are worse than those with CKD, and you can get something called metastatic calcification. And we see that calcification is appearing much more so in these precursors to heart attacks in coronary plaques, essentially, than they would in the general population. We also see cholesterol crystals appearing more often, uh, and these have actually been found to pierce the arterial intima, or the innermost layer of the artery, coronary artery, in those that experienced acute coronary death. And when these plaques actually disrupt, uh, they attract inflammation and platelet formation, uh, which can cause an acute rhombus formation and essentially a coronary occlusion. And we can see here that disruption is more common in those with CKD. So again, it really is without question that there are a significant relationship between kidney disease and heart disease and, and vice versa, which also represent cardiorenal syndrome, again, availing themselves really to ample opportunities for study uh, and clinical trials. So let's move on to, uh, to biomarkers, especially serum creatinine. Um, so in essence, we know that given the strong relationship between CKD and, and other comorbid illnesses. Uh, we need to identify, manage, and, and follow kidney injury, especially in the context of clinical trial endpoints. Um, and there needs to be nuanced biomarkers for such. The most widely known and utilized in, in kidney dysfunction or even uh, normal kidney functioning is serum creatinine. And serum creatinine is essentially a byproduct of muscle, which is uh, freely filtered by the kidneys and, and therefore uh, really allows for the evaluation of renal clearance um, for GFR. Now, in both clinical trials and clinical management, there really needs to be consideration for not only accuracy, but also the relief of patient burden, as we'll see in clinical trials, when conducting these tests to evaluate kidney function. So therefore, you know, with that in mind, serum cranning is in turn utilized in estimation formulas. And we're going to talk about some of those formulas as the, as the talk progresses. Uh, with regard to the uh, kidney functionality evaluation, um, for a number of reasons, most of which we use these estimation formulas is because of use, um, standardization, and easy reference. Uh, but a major factor, again, entails patient burden, and this is key, especially when it comes to clinical trials and improper collections, which have historically really negated the use of these 24-hour credit um, uh, urine collections for creatinine clearance to measure kidney function. So these are the types of considerations that are nuanced for nephrology trials. And there was a time where these 24-hour urine collections for creatinine clearance uh, to estimate kidney function was thought to be the gold standard. However, that's really no longer the case. And there are, unfortunately, a number of issues with our current biomarker of serum creatinine uh, especially as an endpoint, and some of these include the following in these bullet points here, is that, for one thing, serum cranium does, does not really accurately reflect the GFR in a patient that's not in a steady state. So if you've got someone that's got acute injury or acutely worsening kidney function, uh, it tends not to represent GFR uh, very accurately. Also, as I described earlier, the very fact that it's dependent on muscle mass is also problematic because depending on your age, gender, and race, which we'll actually delve into as well, uh, and we're going to show you an example of some examples of this, uh, also make it problematic because a certain serum creatinine value for one individual, depending on what each of these um, components are, uh, can be very different from another. Additionally, uh, if we're looking at kidney recovery, serum creatinine is actually removed by dialysis and so it's actually difficult to estimate uh, what the kidney function is once a subject uh, or patient progresses to uh, dialysis. And historically, epidemiologic studies have used different cutoffs, which really confounds uh, comparisons. So let's talk about some of these estimation formulas. I'm not going to spend a large amount of time, just in the interest of time. But historically, let's talk about some of these formulas. One of the earliest uh, that was developed uh, was the Cockroft Galt uh, that was developed in 1973. I'm not going to give away my age, but let's just say that was well before my time. Uh, 
but for a long time it was actually utilized um, with regard to the evaluation of kidney functionality. Now some of the problems include the fact that the data was uh, from 249 individuals only, most of which were male, uh, with primarily stable uh, creatinine clearance or, or kidney function. Uh, and now this is expressed in milliliters per minute uh, and looks at uh, some different variables. It takes into consideration age, serum creatinine, and gender uh, for a correction factor, but it also looks at weight, which we don't see in our current estimation formulas that are in use. And one of the reasons this is problematic is that if we look at the time period for which it was developed, the obesity epidemic was very different in that era as compared to what it is now. In fact, we don't, we did not actually have any of the many flavored sodas that we have today. So this actually, in fact, uh, would be outdated just from uh, this um, variable here of utilizing weight. The NBRD equation is uh, more recent and is more representative of the uh, patient population and utilizing far more patients, primarily with CKD. Now, in this formula, in the CKD epi formula, which we'll introduce in the next slide, the GFR is actually adjusted for body surface area. And so it's expressed in milliliters per minute for 1.73 uh, meters squared. Uh, which does have its own issues, but this was actually addressed from the FDA's most recent guidance uh, for really just this month, actually uh, a little over a week ago, uh, regarding PK evaluation in the uh, renally impaired population. So there are four variables that are taken into account, the serum creatinine, subject's age, uh, their gender, and their race. And more recently, in 2005, it was actually uh, re-expressed for use with what they call a standardized serum creatinine assay. So this formula actually replaced 186 with 175 to take into consideration the use of a standard assay. Now, this is actually something I wanna focus on. It's actually a very important consideration when you are evaluating local or central lab capabilities, which means that they should be able to uh, run IDMS what they call IDMS traceable assays, and IDMS stands for uh, isotope dilution mass spectrometry. So that's very important because if you're using this formula without a standardized serum creatinine assay, your numbers uh, are going to be skewed. Okay, so the CKD epi uh, equation is the most recent development in estimation formulas for uh, EGFR having been developed in 2009. And it's considered uh, just as accurate as the MDRD for an EGFR less than 60, and much more accurate for those with GFRs greater than 60, which are important considerations across the spectrum, whether it be your healthy normal volunteers, as well as your CKD population. And the variables are exactly the same as they are for the MDRD equation. So let's see how this translates. How, let's take a look at something really interesting, like what would it mean to utilize the same serum creatinine value in differing variables from the um, CKD epi equation in this case? So in this case, we're looking at differences in age, we're looking at differences in gender, we're looking at differences uh, in race as well. As you can see, the same serum creatinine value um, will confer different GFRs based on each of these variables. Now, age does play a large uh, role in this, and because these estimation formulas take into account that as we age, unfortunately, we do lose uh, percentages of kidney function as the years progress. But we can see that some of these differences can be substantial. In this 83-year-old uh, white female, we see that her staging would be at stage three. For this gentleman, it would be stage two if there were markers of kidney damage. And in this gentleman here, uh, the GFR would be considered normal or stage one if there were markers of kidney damage uh, present. So really, uh, it re really reiterates my point that, uh, and my previous sentiment really, that uh, suggests that we need, uh, there's a significant need for improved or additional uh, markers of kidney disease evaluation and that using serum creatinine is really not as good as EGFR for endpoints or outcomes in clinical trials. 
So with that in mind, um, the establishment of uh, objective endpoints in nephrology trials are key. And we'll get into this in more detail as we progress through the presentation. But let's, let's look at some of these clinical endpoints that are typically used in nephrology trials. You know, we've really probed uh, serum creatinine. And because of the uh, nuances involved, uh, as we discussed, is really not the best as we discussed. However, you know, traditionally a doubling of um, serum creatinine values have been utilized in the past as an endpoint, which confers approximately a 40 to 57 percent decline in EGFR, which is substantial, but at the same time, very variable. Uh, if you remember this, this previous slide, there's a lot of variability involved with that. So other traditional clinical endpoints include um, EGFR, and generally decline of 30 to 40 percent has been thought to be appropriate, but you know, given the kidney's remarkable uh, ability to adapt, um, changes in GFR may actually not be specific to the overall kidney or systemic disease phase. Uh, also, short-term changes in GFR might actually represent more hemodynamic effect, which are actually heavily impacted by certain medications than the longer-term effects, which would actually conversely suggest perhaps a um, change on nephron mass. Now, we talked a little bit about protein uh, and albuminuria, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as well, but there are differing ways that uh, this can be collected uh, with spot urine analysis or a 24-hour urine collection, and, and this consideration is also important. But as we talked about earlier, uh, the evaluation of proteinuria and albuminuria is very important in terms of overall prognosis um, and disease course. Here, kidney failure, although kidney failure is an accepted clinical endpoint for clinical trials that um, evaluate CKD progression, it can actually be very impractical, uh, especially for those disease processes that may progress um, very slowly and predominantly will affect older individuals. A long duration of follow-up in such cases would be required, and uh, many patients could actually potentially die of other complications of CKD such as the aforementioned um, cardiovascular disease. Similarly, mortality, uh, specifically all-cause mortality, is not an optimal primary outcome in nephrology trials, uh, either because of really its insensitivity to um, any tangible effects on the particular causes of death uh, related to kidney disease. And it is also really not generalizable to the differing uh, patient populations. And we'll talk about that in one of our um, uh, ladder slides. So the use of surrogate endpoints has become increasingly important, uh, especially in the quality trials. And basically, surrogate end endpoints are uh, defined as uh, measured effects of treatments, so uh, such as novel biomarkers that are intended to, say, substitute for a clinical endpoint, uh, which in turn is expected to predict a clinical benefit or harm or, or lack thereof and could potentially accelerate the testing of new therapies, uh, especially uh, in the earlier stages of, of CKD. And that's important, that's key, because the additional advantages are that the scale of effect of um, a therapeutic intervention, the course over which it actually happens on, on these surrogate endpoints, can actually help in choosing dose ranges and titration uh, in phase two trials. And they can also help us better understand the effects of interventions and, and guide our therapy. And certainly, uh, with a greater understanding of the relationship between these surrogate endpoints and these clinical endpoints, um, comes really a, a higher likelihood for establishing uh, surrogate's validity. So it's, it's really taken a very center stage in nephrology trials. So uh, with that in mind, I, you know, as an example, let's take a look at an area that's really particularly interesting and exciting as it relates to membranous nephropathy and just kind of exemplifies what I was talking about. So membranous nephropathy uh, is an autoimmune glomerular disease. And um, glomeruli, or the glomerulus, are basically clusters of blood vessels at the head of the nephron. We talked earlier about the nephron being the, uh, the functional or structural unit of the kidney. So there are many glomeruli uh, in the kidneys as well because they're basically the head of the nephron and are also structurally supported and enveloped by a membrane. And this is where uh, filtration, early filtration takes place. Now, in this disease process, you can have a primary process or a secondary. A secondary process means that it's due to something else, like, say, hepatitis C, for which you would actually have to 
treat that underlying disease process. Um, whereas in a primary process, you'd have to, it's, it's generally an autoimmune process. And we used to call it idiopathic because uh, prior to 2009, we really didn't have an idea as to what the cause or the etiology of uh, membranous nephropathy was. Now we do know that up to 80% of cases can be caused by a specific antibody, which is the anti-PLA2R antibody. And what ends up happening is that it actually attacks a transmembrane protein that's actually a podocyte that lines this, this glomerular membrane. And what ends up happening is you have this antibody antigen deposition or these immune complexes that then allow protein loss from these glomeruli. So basically membranous means that the glomerular basement membrane or that, uh, that filtering uh, membrane actually becomes disrupted. And it can cause something called nephrotic syndrome where the subjects lose a substantial amount of protein uh, in the urine and can be very debilitating and cause worsening kidney function over time, but it can also cause low protein levels. The patient can have symptomatology such as severe swelling, uh, but over time they can progress to end-stage renal disease. Now, if, uh, for those of you that have um, a lot of experience or experience in the past of treating patients, you can see that these medications are very generalizable. They're not very specific um, to uh, membranous nephropathy. There's not a lot of differing medications. In fact, medications very commonly in nephrology disorders tend to be frequently repurposed, and that's very problematic. And we'll discuss that further towards the end of this presentation. But there aren't a lot of unique uh, treatments for these autoimmune disorders affecting the cut kidney, and so it's a very big area of study. Uh, and of course, this is very problematic because really what we have are blood pressure medicines that also tend to uh, lower protein. We have diuretics, which really just help with uh, hypertension as well, as well as swelling. But we have some very strong immunosuppressive medication, which were never labeled for members nephropathy. A lot of these treatments end up being off-label, and some of these are actually directly caustic to the kidneys themselves. So the treatment paradigm for members nephropathy really hasn't changed much, unfortunately, in the past 30 years. Although we've made great strides in how we view this treatment of this disease. So if we take a look at the natural course of those with membranous nephropathy, for instance, from this landmark study from the early 90s um, that looked at prospectively 100 patients with, at the time, called idiopathic membranous nephropathy that didn't actually receive any immunosuppression for it. And although it's potentially very debilitating, uh, up to 30 to 40, uh, 30 and 40 percent of individuals can potentially go into complete and partial remission respectively, which is quite interesting. So to the point where at that time in the early 90s, the view was that perhaps the benefit of immunosuppressive therapy actually did not outweigh the risks. Despite the fact that we now know today that one in seven of these individuals that have this nephrotic range of proteinuria where they're putting out more than three and a half grams per day um, may actually progress to ESRD at five years. But at that time, there was a notion that maybe these patients didn't benefit from aggressive therapy. And certainly, a lot has really evolved from that time period. And take a look at this. Take a look at the, the course here. Now that we have the PLA2R antibody, if we have a staining that's positive in the kidney biopsy, that tells us that this is more than likely a primary process that's taking place. Because in the past, it was kind of hard to differentiate histologically what might be primary and secondary. So now this biomarker, this anti-PLA2R antibody, allows us to confirm that perhaps the subject has uh, primary membranous nephropathy. But look at the predictive qualities of this immunologic activity. We can see that as the immunologic activity goes into remission, or as the antibody goes into remission, all the prolonged and occurring later can actually predict the remission of proteinuria or the clinical endpoint. And that's absolutely astounding uh, and key. So that's very advantageous. And for prior to 2009, uh, we did not have this advantage. So we now know that this immunologic effect has predictive qualities with regard to proteinuria, which in turn can determine renal dysfunction. And in conjunction, as we discussed earlier, it's important when we think about it in terms of comorbid disease processes and mortality. 
Now we can actually also use this to predict um, clinical relapse, which is significant. We can see that as the PLA2 or antibody comes back, even though it's protracted and takes a longer period of time, we can accurately predict that there will be a return in proteinuria. So this is key, uh, and it's absolutely astounding. Even more amazing is just how this has actually changed the treatment paradigm for this disease process. So this paradigm shift has really afforded a lot of advantages of studying this disease process, um, especially when it comes to pre-identification of patients. So we can now pre-identify these patients with the elevated PLA to our antibody levels, which can actually accurately predict clinical disease activity, and that's huge. And the use of this immunologic biomarker really also affords us an opportunity to affect follow-up periods, uh, given the rapidity of efficacy signals before a clinical effect. So being able to shorten our so essentially Furthermore, with regard to patient population enrichment, a positive biopsy will also help confer a primary diagnosis rather than a secondary because there's always the fear that you're not going to be putting in subjects that have a primary membrane nephropathy, and you may actually have some that have a secondary process. So all of these considerations are really important when we're evaluating novel biomarkers or maybe even existing biomarkers for use in clinical trials. So this now leads us up to uh, study design. What are the requirements for success? And understanding that you know, there truly is a paucity, there really is a paucity of reliable information uh, for those with kidney disease <clears throat> and their comorbid conditions, KDGO actually convened an international uh, multidisciplinary conference to, to address these challenges of conducting clinical trials in nephrology. Um, and actually, that meeting took place uh, this very month, just about four years ago. And the publication that ensued from that, as you can see here in the lower left-hand corner, was actually, um, actually came out the following year, just three years ago. So ultimately, the focus revolved around four major areas uh, that were required to be successful uh, in clinical trials and, and related to nephrology. <clears throat> and even though these, these four points might seem intuitive, they truly do consider uh, this unique patient population that those with CKD actually represent. And that includes the fact that we need to really randomize a sufficient number of patients for these trials. Now, that might, that, might, that might actually sound easier said than done, but the thing that we have to consider is that in nephrology trials, most of the disease processes should be considered as um, rare disease. Uh, especially when we look at it within the country or even worldwide, a lot of these disease processes are considered quite rare. Um, we have to have assurance of adherence to the assigned treatment, or that's just gonna decrease the statistical power uh, of the study. And again, as I talked about earlier, with subjects and patients, <clears throat> excuse me, tending to be on far more uh, medications than the average population, adherence can be quite difficult. Accurate assessment of the related study outcomes are also uh, very important. We have to make sure that uh, subjects are, are making their, their clinic visits, but that the, the, the study outcomes that we are looking at are actually relevant to the population that we are studying, uh, similar to the anti-PLA-2 or antibody as an example specific to membrane nephropathy. And at the end of the day, appropriate statistical evaluation is absolutely key. So let's take a look at uh, some of these things here um, with regard to study design considerations. How are we to be successful in achieving the trial objectives that will ultimately impact uh, clinical development? So let's take a look at some uh, specific areas from this table that were discussed at the KDGO meeting uh, and are particularly relevant for nephrology trials. So here we have the trial objectives over here, which include addressing the trial questions reliably, uh, optimizing uh, recruitment, achieving good adherence, and making sure you achieve uh, an unbiased analysis. And here we see the nuanced challenges in kidney disease as they relate to clinical trials and, and ultimately the impact on clinical development. And here we have some studies, designs, and procedures that are meant to mitigate some of these issues. So 
kind of like what we talked about earlier with membrane nephropathy, um, there are a lot of treatments already in use, primarily off-label. And despite the lack of reliable safety and evidence, um, investigators may actually be reluctant to compare IP against uh, placebo because a, a, a treatment actually does exist, even though it was not originally intended for that disease process. Uh, like we talked about earlier, there are challenges of identifying large numbers of, of eligible patients. Um, we have to ensure in that context that we're not assuming an unrealistically large relative risk reduction in these populations. And of course, significant non-adherence will severely diminish the statistical power of our trials. And we have to be able to identify suitable outcomes and that, that they are relevant to patients, prescribers, at the end of the day, payers, um, that uh, we address the potential and consistent outcomes in other pivotal trials and the use of um, total mortality alone, or as a composite, we talked about earlier as a primary outcome, really tends to reduce statistical power for the reasons we discussed earlier. So some of the mitigation uh, could be to uh, really look at the differences between treatments, and they really have to appeal to patients. And that's one of the things that we look at, uh, Carrie and I and our medical and operations teams look at in terms of uh, uh, potential medications that we're studying is that if it will appeal to the uh, specific treatment uh, populations and, of course, the PIs and, and, and the sites, and ensuring that the, the sample sizes are realistic and that we're looking at adherence and, and drop potential dropout rates and that the primary outcomes are actually fixed, that we don't actually have too many primary outcomes, which can be problematic if 50% of your primary outcomes comes through, but the other half don't use of surrogate endpoints, which we exemplified earlier, uh, can really help decrease the, the sample size requirements. And of course, we need to make sure that we're allowing sufficient amount of time uh, for study treatments. The outcome selections really have to be relevant and measurable without undue burden to subjects. Um, you know, as an example for, you know, dialysis patients, uh, they are a captive audience. We know that they're going to be on dialysis um, three days a week, so being able to um, design their site visits around dialysis uh, when they are on dialysis makes it much easier for them to be seen. Um, some challenges in terms of recruitment is that we often exclude those with kidney disease, kidney disease which unfortunately results in um, difficult recruitment and lack of general uh, generalizability. So, of course, pre-identification becomes very important, and we want to make sure that we're enriching the population and avoiding um, unnecessary exclusion of potential subjects, but also not including subjects that uh, would not benefit from the potential treatment. Um, high medication intervention burden, which really we can't stress enough uh, in those with CKD or an important consideration. So, again, pre-identification and databases are extremely important. Um, and potentially uses of a run-in uh, may also help in the uh, study design to mitigate uh, those that may drop out. And again, as we talked about, reduction of burden and procedural visits uh, where possible. And again, ensuring that the trials are not underpowered and, and, and focusing on subgroup analyses can help ensure uh, that your, your trials are adequately powered and uh, utilization of statistical analysis plans would actually include uh, intent to treat analyses as the primary, and again, limiting the number of subgroup analyses is key. And, and as we decide on endpoints are extremely important, uh, especially as it relates to primary, secondary, and exploratory endpoints, and ensuring that they're really relevant to, to the population. So, um, as promised, uh, I, I, I want to make sure that I, I showed you the, the numerous areas um, in CKD and ESRD that, that require notable uh, evaluation. By no means is this list meant to be uh, exhaustive. It's not ultimately comprehensive. However, Carrie and I would be more than happy um, to discuss with you uh, how we can expand uh, these potential areas in nephrology, which include nephrology specifically itself, as well as nephrology related device, uh, which we would be happy to uh, discuss with you and help you with. But I really want to just leave you all with this uh, one sentiment. And, and really, overall, you know, success really starts with our close collaborations. And I know from my own ex perspective, my own experience, 
our very close collaboration with our operations team, you know, our, our medical and operations team, uh, such as with Carrie, who's going to be speaking in a moment, who I, you know, I, of course, enjoy working with very much. It's really required for success. That integration, you know, of the medical and operational perspectives are absolutely key to successful trials in, in many different ways, including team training, site identification, regulatory aspects, patient recruitment, retention activities, uh, some of which uh, were described in the table. I know Carrie's going to get into some of that as well. So uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague, Carrie Scheel, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ajay. I can only echo your sentiment um, and the importance of the collaboration between the medical and operational perspective. Um, so next slide. I'm just going to highlight some ways to um, approach feasibility, optimize patient recruitment, and really leverage lessons learned from related clinical trials in order to have successful CKD studies. Um, so as sponsors are building out their clinical development plan, it's really beneficial to bring in that experienced medical and operational team to support early engagement with the regulatory agencies. Um, that input and, and discussion will really help inform the appropriate endpoints as well as the development of the protocol. So tying in all those key areas that Ajay just went through to build you know, the right protocol and have a successful pathway. Um, it, it goes along with that to have a thought out strategy for running the trial. And so, um, again, just that development and early engagement is really critical. Next slide. So a successful trial starts with that thoughtful, strategic, and proactive planning. Um, the key team members brought together will assess any potential risks and collectively plan mitigations um, that are implemented at the onset. So when looking at approaching feasibility, you want to do it in a very strategic way. So using a diverse and informative um, analytic platform or multiple platforms to assess competitive landscape and overall trends will really help um, inform and, and diversify your population. Also including a large pool of investigators with a wide range of specialties um, supports a robust feasibility. And then by casting that wider net, you can look across the pool of potential sites and focus on key areas to ensure that those sites have the infrastructure, resources, access to subjects, a well-profiled network, and the appropriate collaborations internally and externally. Um, early engagement of the PIs is useful in developing the protocol as well, and having them connected to the program through the science of the compound will engage and increase their interest and enhance the success of the trial um, in terms of getting additional physicians on board as investigators and um, broadening your pool um, for, for the trial to be successful. An area that we've seen to be um, critical for CKD is also engaging with um, site networks, consortiums, um, advocacy groups, and then also um, patient-centered avenues. So community engagement is really important, and I'll, I'll touch on that um, as we move through the slides. So next slide. So that early engagement that I mentioned and, and really connection with the sites is also going to support expediting startup activities. So once sites start getting selected, then the race is on to accelerate towards getting that first patient in. And some ways to help support the site are using a variety of techniques um, in contracting using agreed upon templates including um, specific budget needs that are catered to that specific site setup. So, you know, MedPace has a well-profiled network and we'll leverage utilizing sites we've worked with before. We already have existing negotiations that we will implement um, for any new, new trial and, and really try and support the site through that process of the negotiation. That will also support their submission process, so working with them to leverage any existing documents that we may have to put together for their package, understanding their setup. If it's in the U.S. and they have a, you know, they can utilize a central IRB but may need a local deferral, um, walking through that process and supporting them through it is, is all going to help enhance the success of the trial and move you towards getting that first patient in. Next 
Next slide. In order to optimize enrollment in CKD trials, it's also beneficial to liberalize the inclusion exclusion criteria. And I know Ajay was able to give some hints on and ways to, to do that. Um, but I think it's really critical to uh, make sure that you're opening that pool of inclusion exclusion while still maintaining scientific integrity. Um, you'll wanna build interest early and ensure you have connection with the various renal consortiums and advocacy groups. That's also gonna help build motivation and enlist community engagement, um, allowing you to have more successful recruitment. Providing a variety of specific tools for the sites as well as the patients to help support recruitment, and then also ensure retention throughout the trial. Another way um, is supporting the sites through their database search. So, for CKD trials, membranous nephropathy trials, IgA nephropathy trials, understanding what search criteria should the sites use when looking through their database and seeing where they may have um, potential patients they can pre-identify and potentially pre-screen um, will also help enhance their recruitment potential and in turn reduce some of the burden on, on the sites as they can focus in that search. Next slide. So patients and caregivers are really seeking better ways to improve their health, specifically in this arena. So it's vital to reduce any burden so that they see clinical trials as an avenue for um, enhancing their health and really um, improving quality of life, reducing some of their symptoms, and um, getting better overall patient care. And ways that we wanna do that in, a, in these clinical trials is perhaps staging the consent process. If the patient can do a portion of the procedures just to see if they're even eligible, um, that you know helps them and then they could do the next section of the consent once they know that they're eligible as opposed to having to go through the full process at the onset and, and that could be, um, it can instill some anxiety in some patients. So if we can try and focus them in, really hone in on what we're looking at for the clinical trial, it'll just increase their engagement and, and really help um, enhance overall enrollment. From the site's perspective, if they can open their sites up to accommodate flexible hours, um, that often helps the patients if they're, you know, working and, and mobile and, um, you know, they need to have that flexibility. Also, alternatives to traditional study visits. So, in this um, era of the pandemic, this has become really crucial to have options for the patients. Um, leveraging virtual options, um, ePro, e-diaries, things that are gonna help keep them on track um, and maintain that oversight, but in an alternative way um, and reducing the number of perhaps on-site visits. Next slide. Patient education is also really critical with this group of, of patients. Um, community engagement in um, providing education tools to the community that enhance why clinical trials are so important, um, reducing the symptoms, improving their quality of life, and ways to tap into that can be through the ambassador programs, patient advisory groups, um, and, and peer advocates, um, providing them with patient-oriented resources, um, utilizing specific websites, and um, electronic study materials, again, just trying to reduce the burden and increase the education and open the, um, open the recruitment pool for these trials is really critical. Next slide. So in summary, as I, I'm watching our time, um, the, the key to success in, in clinical trials, it starts with the collaboration of the medical and operational perspective. Um, sponsors, you know, will look to have a team that has therapeutic and scientific leadership throughout the program. They can support regulatory guidance, um, have an experienced team to determine the optimal regulatory pathway, allow proactive planning, and implement contingencies. Ensure streamlined communication across all uh, functions and vendors. Provide practical, creative, flexible solutions to reduce site and patient burden, um, really support those sites to maintain compliance to the protocol, enhance trial oversight and monitoring, 
and um, first and foremost, or, or finally, patient safety and data quality. Um, if you do all of those initial things, that's what's ultimately going to lead to a successful trial and ensure that you do have that patient safety. And with that, I think we will move to the question section with Sonia. Thank you very much. That presentation was very insightful. We have a lot of questions coming in for the audience, but unfortunately, we'll only be able to do at least two questions. But if you still want to send in your questions, please send them through the questions chat box. And with that, I will start with the first question. So are you guys ready? And here we go. Are there other biomarkers similar to the anti-PLATR or 2R that could potentially be looked at for membranous nephropathy? Yeah, I can take that question actually. Um, thank you. That, that's a, actually a very great question. And so there are actually other antigens similar to um, PLA2R that uh, autoimmune processes in the uh, form of antibodies will attack. And, and those include um, uh, antigens such as THSD7A, which, which stands for um, uh, thrombospondin type 1 uh, domain containing 7A, and, and that's a transmembrane protein. And that's also located on podocytes that um, that line the membrane that we had talked about uh, before. Uh, there's also NEL1, uh, which stands for uh, um, neural epidermal growth factor like one, and and both probably make up a fair proportion of those that are anti PLA two R uh, negative uh, in membranous neuropathy. But thanks for that great question. Okay, we'll squeeze in one more question here. Given COVID-19 adding challenges and limitations, how can sponsors support sites in starting new trials and continue existing trials? Yeah, this is Carrie. I'll take that one. That's a, that's a great question and certainly on the minds of, of many sponsors and, and sites at this time. So I think just really focusing on reducing that burden, providing resources and support and removing barriers um, for the patient. Um, that's what, what's going to allow the trials to continue and new trials to start up. I think another aspect is really to leverage technology, looking at those virtual options, telehealth, even biosensors and remote patient monitoring devices to support the collection of data without taxing the patient. Um, those are going to be keys to success um, in this time of the pandemic, whether you have an ongoing trial or you're trying to start up a new trial. Okay, thank you very much, Carrie, for that. Well, thank you very much for those questions. We have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If we couldn't attend to your questions, the team at MedPace may follow up with you after this presentation. Now, if you have any further questions, please direct them to the email address that's on your screen, and that's info at medpace.com. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, I'm about to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event at that link and also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording as well. So I encourage you to do that and get even more out of today's presentation by downloading the supporting materials available under the handouts tab. And we have two there for you, Deep Dive Cardiovascular and Deep Dive Nephrology. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers for today's webinar, Dr. Srivastava, Senior Medical Director in the Medical Department, and Carrie Scheel, Senior Director in the Clinical Trial Management, both with MedPace, for that very insightful and detailed in, uh, presentation. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at X Talks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, please take care and bye for now.